Hi, I'm Maria Thea Harris of LSOs on social media. Welcome back to So Over 50 podcast on So Organized Style. Grab a cuppa and relax with us. So Organized Style podcast acknowledges traditional owners of country throughout Australia. We pay our respects to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander cultures and to the elders past, present and emerging. Thanks for joining us on a special So Over 50 podcast. So Over 50 intersects with all communities. We're welcoming back our friend and previous podcast guest, Angie Hinksman. She's a So Over 50 follower and since her podcast last year, she's been really busy with the sewing and was on the telly in the lead up to Christmas last year. Welcome back to the podcast, Angie. It's great to have you back. How are you? I'm good. I've gotten over the whole TV thing, you know, it took me a while to get my head around it. It was bonkers, really. But yeah, it was really, really good. Lots of new things happening because the week that I got asked to do television, I got a new job. Oh, everything happened at once. My local sewing shop, which I've been using since lockdown, really. I know them all very well. I shop there a lot and a job came up and I thought, oh, that's me. Part time on a Saturday in a sewing shop. Fantastic. And then the whole Kirsty Olsop handmade Christmas thing came up. And I went for the interview of this job. And halfway through the interview, I said to Carolyn, the boss, I said, I've got to stop now because my head is just all over. I'm listening to what you say. And I know it's important, but I've got to go home and design a doll for a TV competition. <laughs> I'm just sort of torn. And it, it just went from there. So I got home and they rang me from the TV show and said, yeah, we'd love you to be on. Not only do we want you to make a doll, we want you to make a life-size doll. Wouldn't that be cool? And I'm kind of like, oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, fine. That would be great. I can do that. That's good. And the whole point was that it's not exactly life-size, but the point was that the doll's a fairy, so the child who owns the doll can wear the fairy wings and the tiara, and it's a really interactive thing. So I thought, yeah, that's, that's fun. And it was just... Two or three days later, Carolyn said, yes, we'd love you to start the job. That's wonderful. And that day, the producer of the show rang me up and said, no, Angie, I want you to sit down. I'm going to tell you this. And then you can put the phone down and scream. And she said, yes, you're in. You're on the show. I'll email you later. And I sort of sat on the sofa just in silence thinking, what on earth have I done? You know, I've just said yes to TV. You know, and I'm thinking, how am I going to make this doll? I've got to get to Devon, which is the other side of the country. How am I going to get there? What am I going to wear? You know, all these things. Then I'm thinking, and I got past all that. And getting there was the nervous thing. It was, oh, being there, we were in COVID restrictions. We were in a green tent rather than a green room. Right. So it was a bit marky. It was huge, beautiful, beautiful stately home, 16th century. Amazing. But we couldn't stay there because, which is a shame. So I'm on the train thinking, yeah, this, it'll be fine. It'll be fine. And it was quite a long journey. And I got to Devon. And it's 11 o'clock at night. And there's this chap in a suit holding a sign saying, Angie Hinksman. And I thought, damn, I should have taken a picture of that. Because it's, you know, like when celebrities go to the airport, and there's somebody holding their name. It was hilarious. It was wonderful. And I remember coming home from it and thinking, that was wonderful, what an experience. And then a week before it was on telly, I was thinking, oh, my God, people are going to see me now. And that bit hadn't so I've gone in. I'm thinking, people all over the country are going to see me. It was just so... It was terrifying, actually. I sort of said to the kids, you watch it. I'll be in the kitchen and you can just shout to me and tell me what happened because I don't really want to watch. But I did. And it was weird, but it was fine. And then I think it was my son and my daughter said to me, but the thing is, mum, you see something strange. We just see you as you always are. You don't look any different to us and you don't sound any different to us. But to me, it was just like watching a stranger. I did watch. I did sit in the kitchen and Rosa said it was our watch party, she called it. You know, it was adorable. But it was really, really lovely. We had a fabulous time. There were four competitors, three women and a chap, the chap who won. And we were all had really interesting backgrounds as well. And in some ways, the pandemic sort of added to our backgrounds. One woman who made a beautiful, beautiful wooden jewellery box that played Christmas carols. It was balsa wood, so it was thin wood, and she burned the pictures on it. So it was almost like tattooing, very intricate, just stunning. She had been working as a teacher and then had a really awful experience in her teaching job or as teaching assistant and left her career suddenly and then had a child. And then, then it was like, what do I do now? And, you know, trying to deal with not working, having a child. And she started creating. She, started, she became a maker and she made things at night when her daughter, Poppy, was in bed. 
So that was a really interesting story. Another girl, she was very young. She was in her 20s. And she was from the north of England. And she moved to Manchester to go to university. And the week she got to uni in her halls of residence, lockdown. So she was stuck in this building oh. on her own with lots of people she didn't know and couldn't know because they weren't allowed to be together. And she couldn't go anywhere. And she was doing uni via, you know, Zoom. And I just couldn't imagine that. You imagine being, you know, in your early 20s and leaving home and then being in this room. And she was already doing 3D art. So she made 3D models, polymer clay, and for stop motion. And she, she works mainly on commission. And she's making things for people like the company who make Wallace and Gromit. Oh, wow. That sort of thing. So super, super talented girl just lovely and she walked in and she was in this beautiful set of dungarees green rayon dungarees with a matching mask that she made and I thought wow how talented this young girl and then the chap who won well there were two things he was he was sort of my age and he did bear a striking resemblance to Father Christmas and it kept getting mentioned (laughs) I think he got a bit fed up with that but it was hilarious he was a master toy maker and he worked with people who were vulnerable and he did art therapy and he worked in the prison service with art and just really fascinating. So it was really interesting talking to people about their stories and how they came to do it. Yeah, it was wonderful. Really enjoyed it. Although it was in the south of England, the production company are based in Scotland. There were all these Scottish people sort of running. It was really interesting. And all of the, I'd say the managers, the people in charge were women, which was nice. And the people who were sort of doing all the running were the young lads. I think it was an intention of the people who own the company, who own it. Mm. And I thought, how interesting. We all had our own producer and my producer, Zoe, was this tiny little woman, tiny she was. And I walked out to go to the loo and I saw her tearing a strip off this lad who was about six feet tall and he was quivering. And she was saying, you you knew what you were meant to do and it wasn't right. Just get it sorted. And she was so impressive. And I, I just thought what women can do when they're allowed to you know, show their stuff and show their creativity and their confidence. And she was just utterly in control, as was everybody. It was re- really impressive. Really, really good. But yes, so that was my toys. <laughs> Angie, I'm really pleased that you could come on to the podcast and for a second time, because when you came on, it was just a hi, meet Angie. Yeah. And her amazing duvet dresses that she'd been making <laughs> during lockdown. Yes. And how many months later and you've gotten this opportunity? How does yeah, it feel? Exactly. It's, you know, and it's all because of this. On honestly, no word of a lie. See, it feels wonderful, by the way. It really does. And I feel really proud and pleased with my own uh, achievements, you know. But it all started. You can apply for the competition or they can scout you. And this producer had seen my work on the Black Makers Matters Mm -hmm. Facebook page. And I didn't even realize that the Instagram page also went onto the Facebook page. And she then went from that to So Over 50 and then from that to the podcast. She said she was just bowled over and I thought, wow. So thank you. Thank you. You know. Or hail Maria. (laughs) Oh, hail Angie. (laughs) Hail So Over 50 and the Makers. Yeah, absolutely. And I keep saying this over and over, but it's what social media was meant to be about. People sharing their experiences, sharing their skills and their crafts, you know, like-minded people raising each other up rather than, you know, being annoyed and trying to tear people down or moan about whatever or trying to sell you something you don't actually want. And I just thought that these these things, all of these, this circle of things, yeah. I think shows that to a T, really, really does. And this circle of things that you, that you talk about, mm. we're all here to make sure that our community has values. As you say, we raise each other up. Absolutely. You know, the Black Makers Matter, so are the 50, you know, and mm. by supporting them on the podcast and mm. you're being brave enough to come on in the first place. Well, yes. <laughs> yes. And it was. I mean, that, and you know what? That It was funny because I was thinking, I was telling my daughter about this, this the TV and she says, Mom, if you can do a podcast, you can do anything. You've done it now. You're fine. Just go, you know, <laughs> just think about that. Just pretend it's just not being filmed. You're just talking. And she was, and she was right, you know. Yeah. It was. These things, they build up your confidence, I think. They do. And they make you braver. And they also, I think, they show you what's out there and what the possibilities are. And you think, well, actually, I could do this now or I could do, you know, whatever. It's just, it's, it's a real stepping stone, you know, a catalyst mm. really. Definitely. All the work that is being done by community groups like ours mm. with Sailor mm. 50, Black Makers Matter 
and what I'm doing mm. on the podcast. We're focusing on the people in our maker community. Absolutely. Making sure that people know that they're there and they're passionate yes. about what they do. Yes. Yes. And yes. that they have a real life that they live as well. Absolutely. Absolutely. And also, I think particularly for women, actually, if you're a maker, it can be quite isolated. You know, men tend to be in workshops, you know, I mean, I know this sounds very sexist, but it's it's often the case. I've got friends who are makers who do like upholstery and mm-hmm. they tend to be in a workshop with other men and it's, you know, but we tend to do things like sewing and crafting and it, it can be very, very solitary. And also men are very good at bigging themselves up and saying, look at this, I've made it, I'm wonderful, blah. And we aren't, we should be. And I think we're getting better at it. And I think sometimes we still look at things like sewing and crafting as this little thing we do as a hobby Mm -hmm. to occupy us. And it's not, it's a skill, it's a profession, it's a craft, it's all those things. And I mean, no longer, and it's taken me a long time, no longer do people say to me, can you run me up a dress or can you just hem this for me? They'll Mm -hmm. ask me now, but they appreciate that it isn't just a, oh, just run it up. You know, it it takes time and skill and experience. And I'm finding that when people come into the shop and they have a query and they say, well, I've started sewing, but I'm really stuck. And she says, oh, you won't understand this. And I do understand. I said, yes, well, this is what I said, bring your project in. We'll look at it. And I said, well, here is what you can do to fix it. And they said, ah, that's what I was missing was that expertise of somebody who's done it before. You know, and I think, yeah. And I love that element of the job. Another aside, I got a woman and her daughter came in. She was a young, she young mom, not oh, probably in her 30s, professional woman. She had her nine-year-old daughter with her and her daughter had her little stuffed dog toy. And the mom said, now tell Angie what you're going to do, what you're making. And she said, I'm making a coat for my dog and a collar and a lead. So I need some material and I need something to make the collar stiff. And, I, and, you know, and we walked around the shop and we, had our, and we finally we decided on some felt and some ribbon for a lead and some more ribbon for the collar and some, you know, interfacing to make the collar stiff. And we started having this conversation, the mother and I, and it turned out she and her daughter had come to a course at the shop where I work. And it was a mother and child beginners to sewing course. Oh, okay. And we started, she started talking about it and she said, it was just so lovely. She said, she's got three children one of which has got additional needs and is the youngest child. And she said, and what happens? And I think this happens often when you have three children as well. The oldest one kind of gets left off and you you don't have that special time alone together, Mm -hmm. often with the oldest child. And she said, it was just so lovely to have this. So so now we have this thing that we do together. We sew. And then she, she was saying, we're talking about sewing during the pandemic and she likened it to meditation. And I thought that's absolutely right. You get in that zone and you're lost in it and you literally as you're sewing you can't think of anything else you can't you know you, you just have to concentrate on that and even if you're hand sewing she was saying it's that lovely motion of pulling the thread round and round it's just so cathartic isn't it and it, it was just the loveliest conversation and I think it just summed up you know what we do as sewers and how it helps us and how it helps us to grow and build our relationships you know I went home thinking that was just the best day you know it was one of the end of the day conversations. I thought, how lovely. But often that happens. And there was another customer who we have a course called Time to Sew. And it's a workshop. It's Tuesday evenings or I think Thursday mornings. And people can come in with a special project. It's two and a half hours. And either myself or the owner are on hand to help with that project. We only have, I think it's up to six people. Right. And it's a real social event. So you can bring, you know, you're working on an evening gown or whatever. And you need some help. And I go sometimes when I've got a big project and I need a big table. And one of the women who goes there works for the NHS for health in England. Yes. And she was talking about COVID and how things are going and how this was her special thing. This was the only thing she had that had nothing to do with anything else. It was pure joy. Just she goes in and she sews and has a laugh with us. And it's just great. And her her first mate, which I thought was amazing. She, she made a man's, her husband's waistcoat, a waistcoat with a collar and the welted pockets. And it was amazing. It was, she said, I'm never making another one, but because it was so, but she's, but I thought, you made that, you can make anything. And at the moment she's making a, I think it was a, a dress shirt for herself mm-hmm. with a traditional shirt. And she'd come in to buy buttons for it. And she said, oh, I'll wear it on Tuesday because I'm so proud of it. And I just thought, that's what it's about. You know, those things. Just, I love it. Love it. I mean, the fact that she made the man's vest, having the confidence to do a work pocket 
and the color. Absolutely. Yeah. It's yeah. really good. It's really good. I was so impressed and she brought it in and I was just, you know, gobsmacked as we say here. And, and, and she'd say all the little things wrong. And I thought, only to you, that nobody else will see them. You'll know these little things. <laughs> I mean, I, I said that I made my own wedding dress, which was a Vogue silk shirt dress. And I went wrong on the collar and somewhere else. And I remember because I was so worried about the collar, my husband bought me a corsage pin on this collar, you know, you know, which was lovely because we got married in a registry office. It wasn't in the church. And then I, I was saying this to one of the girls a few years ago, went and got the dress out of the loft and I couldn't find where the mistake was. <laughs> So I was trying to, oh, I'll show you what I went, where I went wrong. And I'm looking at them thinking, what did I do? So clearly I saw something then, you know, and this is what we do. We, we obsess about these. And I could not, could not find it. And I thought, how funny is that? I was so worried about it. I had to cover it up and God knows what it was. <laughs> Just, it's hilarious. Listeners, doesn't Angie sound so happy? In part two of Angie's next podcast, she goes into the details about her time on the telly and also some work that she's doing, which is really close to her heart. This episode of So Over 50 Podcast on Soul Organized Style was produced by me, Maria Thea Harris, with permission of Angie Hinksman, sound by bensound.com. You can subscribe to So Organized Style Podcast, but with an S, not a Z, on all good podcast apps. Make sure you give us a five-star rating and review, and we hope you'll support us through our Patreon account to keep this podcast running. Make sure you go back and listen to the free library of So Over 50 podcasts we've now published. Post any questions or suggestions you have on our Instagram account at So Organized Style or on our website at www.soorganizedstylepodcast.com or on our Facebook page. We look forward to joining you in your sewing room next time. Stay safe, everyone.